So I started Ocean in 2002 and Oyster in 2004. Uh, they're both private companies. We've been fast track a couple of times up to last time. We prefer for it to be a bit more recently than that, but there we go. Uh, and this year we're revising time at Cricket International. Um, right. I started in the good old days of no computers. When recruitment was recruitment, and I was running between fax machines with address labels on CVs. But um, I was a, a fairly sort of average recruiter. Now, what I want to cover today are the key points in carrying on really from where Ben left off, because that's what you need. How to, not in terms of scaling a recruitment business, because I don't think that's quite the right thing to do. Is it, how do you make a recruitment business scalable? I would say is probably the way of turning that around. So these are the things I'm going to run through. Strategy and vision, business finance, staffing, which we touched upon, moving up. Your back office, which is your engine room. Do not underestimate the back office of your business. Management reporting, you can't run anything blind. Your operational board, and you need an operational board. Um, regional and international expansion, where I finish off, that's where James will carry on, because that's where he carries on from being internationally, he's done extremely well. And the I want to tell you about the results of this implementation. The reason I said yes to Louise is because when she asked me, I was right in the middle of a nine-month strategy to change my business, to move it from being a lifestyle business to a business that realised the ambition I had when I first started it, and having two kids uh, inside 20 months does not help with your ambition, let me tell you. <laughs> right, um, first thing, strategy and vision. And Ben, well, where, are you, where are you, Ben? Right, well, this was really interesting what you were saying because direction is incredibly important. You've got to know where you're going because it's so easy as a recruitment business to have staff and then go, well, they're doing quite well, so let's just get another one. Uh, what about the next one? Well, let's wait for a CV to come through. This does not work, okay? Even if you fast forward just three years and say, what does my business want to look like? And when I say, is it yours? Is it really yours? I'm not talking about looking at a competitor and going, what have they got on their website? What are the niches on there? Well, let's just do that and we'll work back from that. I'm talking about your vision for it. Because until you have a three-year vision, and I think that's about the most you can go to, okay? Then you can't collectively work towards anything. I'm purely operational and strategy. You need to have something that's purely recruitment or I'm afraid sales, recruitment is sales. You're selling <laughs> to people and you're selling candidates to clients. You've got to have, there's no grey area. You have to have a business plan. If you're a business with somebody like you, good luck. Probably won't work. So, is that a vision or is it a value or is it both? If it's a value, that's fine. I had, I had a value for my business in mind. So I had a value, and in order for that value, that had to be a multiple of EBITDA. So therefore, what would it take for me to arrive at that value when I broke it down? I couldn't run an all-permanent recruitment business. I think it would kill me. 12 consultants could have done zero any time, any month. Nightmare. My business is now 70% contract, 30% permanent. 70% covers the cost of my business, 30% is cream on top. 50-50 is fine, as Russell Clements, the best three will tell you, 60-40 is probably a, a, a good average. Is it easily referred to? Now, from an operational perspective, you've got to go back to this. Are you in line with your expectations? Is it there for everybody to work towards? You know, because if nobody knows where, if you don't know where you're going, nobody in your business is going to know, either they're going to sit there and go, yeah, it's great, I'm going to Vegas, I'm taking out the piss every Friday, I love it here, it's great, I get a free lunch and a taste card. Bollocks. They need to know where they're going. Right? You all need to know where you're going. And that has to be a transparent document. It's got to be there where the company sees everything to do with it. Have you incorporated that into your projections? So therefore, have you done an operational budget? Have you done a forecast? Do you look at it every month? Do you say, we're here, and it'll be like a sign, a sign curve for you, the economist bit. Right? So, have you put it within the CEO? Well, actually, we're a bit below here. Well, we're above. That's great. Let's keep it going. Revenue split. Now, when you work backwards, which is ironically what you need to do, you've got to work backwards to go forwards. What's the revenue split in terms of temp and per? What's going to give your business success? What's the headcount? 
Now I know exactly what my business is going to look like in three years. Well, I don't really, but I'd like to think it's going to look like this. And what areas you're going to work in, you have to map this stuff out. Otherwise, you're flying blind and you won't get anywhere. Okay? It's very important. The strategy and the vision is very important. And you will argue about this with your business partner, but you thrash it out, you get it done, you agree with it, and you filter it down throughout the business and everybody adheres to it because then you will go into the same result. Financing your business, this is always a good one. You can't create anything without cash. So people who like strategy, everyone loves a bit of strategy and operations. You can't do it without cash. Now, really, you don't want to use your own. Your own is your own, you've made that, that's lovely, but there are plenty of alternatives. So, sorry, I guess funding lines of the banks are pretty much limited. <coughs> Because banks don't at the moment, they don't really like lending you money unless you're turning over in excess of £2 million, okay? And that's even for the EFG loan which I'm going to come across. If you can help it, don't take a factory line or invoice discounting line with the bank you're a business with. It's an old rule. <coughs> at any point in time, if somebody gets a little bit worried that you haven't got enough cash in the bank and you've got 100 contractors to pay, they might say, do you know what, I'm going to give you 50% this week. So you might well have given you 0.17% management charge and charge you 2% over based on interest on your borrowings, but if they're not going to lend you the money because they've got transparency over both areas, now I'm not saying that we all run our companies to the wire, we don't, but in the early stages we do, we all do it, all right? So if you can help it, get an IT facility outside of that, but with a veritable institution, not with one of these fly-by-night numpties that advertise in the recruitment magazines. Right, EFG loans. Do we all know what EFG loans are? These used to be DTI loans, we all remember them. So it's guaranteed by the government and by the lender. I, I can't remember what the split is, I think it's 75% guaranteed by uh, the government and 25% by the lender. Right? <coughs> so, and you have, might have to put a bit up or something, and you, you basically pay above normal interest rate to get this. But I, I think the headroom for you to borrow this money as a business, providing the figures you show, show that you need the money, but equally show that you can repay it, I think it's up to maybe one million or two million pounds per business, all right? And so you don't need to bother about external funding. Now this is a line over the last 13 years that I've borrowed half a million pounds through. And I'm midway through borrowing another bit of money through it as well, because I don't want to take somebody else's money for a part of my business. I want to use somebody else's money. But who will lend you that money? The bank that owns your debt. So the people that control your debtors will lend you that money. So if you've got an ID line, you might not even realise it, but they may wait to be seen. Oh, this is a nightmare. Been through this. There's some really good private equity houses. Bed's been very good, right? We're not only big enough for bed. I've had a look at a lot of your businesses here. Um, there are a few that are near that point, and Baird has certainly taken an awful lot of recruitment business from, from being good to just simply outstanding, propelled them into the future. Um, <coughs> BC, it's a rocky road if you get a personal recommendation. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. They will want something called carry, which I'm sure you might be aware of, which means they say today your business is worth a million pounds, they come on board. Um, and you sell your business for five million pounds. If they have 25% carriers from one million to five million, so they get a million pounds and you get three million out of that, right? Generally speaking, I don't think you have to pay more than 5% carry, all right? That lasts for 20. Public or private route? Now, I've just been through this. I've been offered to float two months ago. And uh, it was awful. <laughs> it's not like you think it's going to be, you imagine that these wonderful institutions that you probably always looked up to, you know, they're way better than us, which cruises, right? And by the way, a bunch of directors and RBS in one room is a massive security threat, isn't it? So, um, but you go to these people and they will offer you, if you've got to refer, they will offer you reverse intuition. They have shells on the AIM and on the PLUS account, knocking around like you won't believe it's the Wild West. So what I'm saying is it works for some people, the Rethink Group, did a fantastic job publicly. I mean, I think in 2005 their turnover was five million pounds. This year it was 80 million. And they went on the A, they put a fantastic operational board together and they did it. Networkers, Spencer's done a fantastic job down there. He bought MSB when there's about five of them, 150 of them at MSB, probably took balls. 
But he's done really well, and that company's probably worth quite a lot of money. So we <coughs> didn't go ahead with that public flotation because it meant that the control of the business wasn't with us. But the point is, it is an option for you. But in my opinion, it's a distressed option. There are loads of shells around on the Plus, which is the one that's owned by um, ICAP. And uh, it's the one below the AIM. So if you do well with your jet, to join the AIM. That's how good it is. But the AIM will cost you probably a quarter of a million pounds a year just to be on there. Okay? And you'll spend all your time doing bloody bureaucracy and filling in the forms. The irony of staffing. We touched upon this. Uh, anybody wants to know, there's no magic bullet. It doesn't mean it's small, it's small, it's really hard to attract decent staff. 85% of my lot are homegrown. Um, as Ben has quite rightly mentioned, if you find a supplier that's any good, just stick with them. Don't give them a recommendation to anybody else. Pay what they want to pay, pay more than anybody else, get first dibs on their candidates, make them feel special, correct the spelling mistakes, correct their invoices and pay on time. <laughs> We've now got a very, very good training programme. We've been at it for quite a long time. It's a combination of internal and external training. Psychometric testing. I'm sure some of you are going, that's the bullet. Don't work. Actually, it works. And uh, if you speak to, well, Brussels Clemens, for example, started S3 in 1986. He was the third person there. They've got 2,500 staff now, 1,600 recruiters, and made £52 million pound net profit this year. He believes in it. It's good enough for me. Now, we do an academy style intake, which is really, really working. So we take five on every three months with an external train for two weeks in this little pod. And we expect three ounces of those. Moving up and get bigger. This is where you can make some massive mistakes. I've made loads of the mistakes I've made, I reckon, easily, uh, well into seven figures. They're pure cash decisions, right? So, one of the big things for me is even a service office. When do you move from a service office to a leased office? Is anybody in a service office here? Okay, it's quite a tough question because they'll tell you that the, the tipping point is 60 staff, which is frankly hilarious as we all know. But the things to bear in mind when you move to a leased office, um, uh, there are some huge costs involved, to be fair. Right? But this is a great opportunity to do that EFG loan that I was talking about because that sort of thing they love. They love that way. Oh, you're going to move, that's great. Well, you need to make that fun. So deposit it, and generally speaking, with a recruitment business, there's a multiple that landlords use as to whether or not they need a deposit from you. You're never going to hit that multiple, right? You'll forget it. So you're looking at nine months, six months at best deposit. That's rent, just social rent. Plus VAT, they're the only people in the world that are allowed to charge VAT and deposit. Then you've got your fits out, then you've got your now, if I just give you an indication, my last office, the deposit was 70k, fit out was 93,000, my furniture cost me 45,000, my comms top cost me 12,000, I, I didn't have room for any staff. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, you can asset finance it. Okay, so you pay it off over five years, so you find some percent, so you offset it against your profits. So actually, you can really, really bring down the cost of that move, and you've got your own space. But the key thing is getting the size of it right. Don't be that over optimistic like I was. Um, because otherwise, you're sitting around in a big office with 12 spare desks in the middle of London that anywhere else would probably cost, you know, somewhere in the region of three or four thousand pounds a month to rent, and you can't do anything about that because you probably can't sublet it. And with a, with a clause, it's always a five-year lease, get a break clause in the three years. So, you know, ideally you want to be playing half rent for the first year or half rent for 18 months with a break clause of three years. And you need to find a good surveyor. And I've done three or four office moves into leases, so uh, I'm quite well versed on this sort of thing. There's the, also the intangible cost of moving. When people move off, these recruiters move off, say, hey, this is brilliant, love it here. Don't do anything, absolutely nothing. Right, so your figures will go like that unless you stay on top of them and make sure that just because we're in a different area doesn't mean that you can do nothing. Just because it's a little bit nicer and you've got tiles, it doesn't mean you stop working, all right? You've got to keep them going. Right, uh, the back office, and the end, and I'm, I'm very passionate about this because for me, this is something that recruiters forget about all the time. And I'm sure Camino partners have <coughs> this bit of my talk. You've got to have, working with you, an absolutely superb accountant externally, 
okay? And this you get to a proper size, which is growing right here. Right, from Antel, they're big enough, they've got Russell there. You can have somebody, experience groups, I'm going to make a joke about Antel in a minute. Um, <laughs> but you've got to have somebody that can advise you at all times. Um, and that means for you as a business owner, because the reality is that when you start recruiting business, you probably don't know a lot about business. You probably know a lot about recruiting, you don't know a lot about business. And believe me, it takes a long time to learn that. So your finance team, credit control, don't pay them 15 grand a year. You've got to plan for things like corporation tax, self-assessment tax, VAT, VAYE, because if you don't get it right, you won't have management reporting. Cash accounting is for children. It's a transactional basis, form of accounting. You want to move to an accrual system, right? This means that everything is done as it's done, not when it comes in, it's done as it's done. This gives you real-time financial information which you need when you're running a business. If you don't have real-time financial information, you're running it blind. If you're logging onto the bloody bank account, see how much money you've got, all right? Pathetic. Monthly P&L, you need that. And within that P&L, you, you better have good reports in there. You could have performance analysis against the budget that we just talked about. So you've got a three-year plan, you've got a budget plan to go against. You know exactly when you're going to hire, who you're going to hire, what areas you're going to hire in. Historic reporting is quite nice now when we look about how well you do compared to this time last year. Monthly court tax accrual, you can build that into the P&L. Nobody likes being told six months after year round that your court tax is 70k when you budget it for 30. Alright, that ruins Christmas. Management information pack. Now this is something for the operational people that run recruitment businesses. You have to have this on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. Full and flash. Flash. Five days after month then, somebody has to get you a pack. Giving you a P&L of the month before. What the consultants have done. What they built. What it is against budget. Graphs. Anything you like. How many timesheets. How many burn placements are drilled out through, through clients. But they, you know, what's the revenue? What's the gross margin? What's the average GP? Anything you can think of that will give you information. Make sure it's there. Trend analysis. Now, this is important. Because you can go blindly into the dark thinking, well, this is wonderful. This is why we to keep the operational board. Now, this is something that's really, really important. You've all got to club together as an operational board. You've got to decide who's in that. Is it just you and your business partners? Is there somebody else you'd like to bring in? These are, these are the people that really make decisions. And don't bring people in if you're not sure, because you can always add salt, you can't take it away. So our knowledge, probably when we started these businesses, that, you know, my knowledge has a huge, I'm a very limited person. So the, the reality is you've got to bring other people in that can help you to get to the next stage. Then you're at a stage now where you're not sure how to get to that stage three. You know, the non-exec route, which you've already gone down, is, is the route that we've gone down. It took me six months to find that person. You know, I spent an awful lot of time, an awful lot of money, speaking to an awful lot of people to find a non-exec, because I got to the point where we were doing well, but we didn't know how to get to the next stage. You know, my ambition <coughs> suddenly started burning again. I don't want to just sit here, just ticking along like a lifestyle business. I want to take on a few companies. You know, there's McDonald and Co. Judd Farris has gone now and take their place. Co. Well, this is what we do: we do property and survey. Hey, there's nothing in that market. Want to take it all? You can't do it on your own. You're gonna have somebody to help you because when you make a mistake, it's a hundred thousand pounds. It's not ten thousand pounds, and that's bottom line. When you make a bad hire, well, when anybody makes a bad hire, what is it? Twenty k? Something like that. Something like that. Twenty to thirty k. <coughs> and the monthly meetings, you can discuss past past performance and future performance. Regional and international expansion. Um, <coughs> now this depends on your markets and clients, but it's something I think everybody should have at the back of their mind somewhere. Um, how would you structure the company if you did it? Would you do it with joint ventures with other offices? Would you back somebody individually? Do you set up a limited company in Birmingham, maybe a shareholder? Or would they have shares in the, in, in, in the parent company in London, as we are? Um, in terms of international, and James will probably put this in better research, don't believe everything you read. Everyone talks about the BRIC companies at the moment, Brazil, China, India. What they don't tell you is India might be great, but it's a, it's a, it's a margin which is fine, and it's better than the margin we get here, but it's already on a very, very low base, right? And China, I tried doing this in China, it is an absolute nightmare. They can't put their mind out to do anything. 
actually I saw Brian Wilkinson of Randstad, who have seven offices, I believe, in China. And he, had, he, he did a suit, well, it was much better than this, but he did a presentation, and he did a chart of, of, the, of the net fee income, and then the countries that Randstad were in. He had to put in the 21st country for China, because their turnover was only 16 million euros over, over seven offices. Right? And believe me, India was down that way as well. So do your research. If you read, read the papers, you go oh, Brazil, China, you know. Be careful, because Brazil have crazy employment laws. So you might pay them 20 quid a day, but you also got to pay the government 20 quid an hour. They're employment, right? So, you know, do your own research. Um, incubate international offices if you can. Uh, it costs a lot to open any office anywhere, but we're so close to Europe that if you've got an idea of opening an office in Europe, do it for London first. <coughs> Plenty of bilingual here, people here. London's the fifth largest city in France, for example. Uh, true. So, you know, see if you can get it to work here, and then you trust people, then send them over there. Name. If you're thinking about it, I mean, I've got an idea. I want there's four places internationally I want to be in, in three years, so I thought we'll always the work. And it's just about, well, it's hanging in there. So, but make sure that the company name that you have will work across, across markets. And, uh, you know, Antel have done extremely well, by the way, in terms of developing what they're doing. They've franchised it. Tony Goodwin is well known now. It's done very well. I think the profits is still in It's not since implementation. So, this is nine months ago I started this. Our average gross margin is up by 55%. We weren't starting on a really low base, by the way, 10 years on, basically. Uh, quarter one net fee income, which is June, July, and August for us. It's up 27% compared to the period last year. Our headcount's up by 68% because this recruitment academy we bought in, we know who we're hiring and why we're hiring. We didn't before, we were just adding people on because we're expected to go to CVs. <coughs> Our contract of fee income is up 44%, and that's in the tens of thousands, all right? It's not starting at like 800 quid, so we've done 200% more. <coughs> And this, this month is going to be a record month. And it really, really, if you're talking about scaling your business and creating the building blocks and the infrastructure of your business to grow it, you have to know where you're going and work backwards from that. Because otherwise, you go back and forth and backwards and forth and backwards and forth. And it took me 10 years to realise this. So it was January when I first realised. I'm right in the middle of it. We've only just implemented it. And... Um, you know, it's working. I really, really advise you to do the same. Come up with a vision for you. I know there's some cracking businesses here. I've looked at all of your businesses, every single one. Some fantastic businesses here. But have an idea. I think five years is too long, but three years is manageable. Well, you know, sit down. What do you want it to look like? And then work backwards from it. Don't say we want 100 people. Don't be something realistic. Look at the last three. Well, three years ago, you know, where were you then? Probably not a lot different for a lot of you than where you are now. But that's probably because you didn't really know what you're going to do. So work backwards, build in blocks, create the infrastructure, create the team, create the finance team, get the office space. And once you realise where you're going, I can, I'm telling you from now, I think you will find it an awful lot easier. Okay, thank you very much indeed.